Today for week two, we're looking at this uh, subject called, how can I be sure of my salvation? And um, a lot of people, they want to believe that God can forgive them. They, 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 they struggle with believing. I don't know if this is true for me. I think it's true for them. It's true for her. It's true for him. But I don't know if God could uh, forgive me. And today, there may be some of you that want to believe that you're forgiven. You want to believe that you can make a relationship with God right. But the sins of your past sometimes haunt you. And that is true. There are a lot of people that sometimes have sins and mistakes from their past that make him go, um, I don't know if God can forgive this, though. Or I don't know if God is happy with me. And if you've been that person that has been struggling with knowing if God could forgive that or not, I believe that I've been sent here by God today to give you assurance that his blood is greater and his sacrifice on the cross is so much stronger than any mistake that you could have ever made. Uh, but when we talk about salvation, we wonder what is salvation. When we talk about salvation, we use them synonymously in the church with terms like being born again. And so a lot of us could wonder, what does this whole like being born again talk even mean? Does that mean that I have to climb back up into my mother's womb and then get popped again? And that was actually the guess that this religious teacher named Nicodemus, who was a really powerful Bible teacher, um, scholar, yeah. back in Jesus' day, that's what he thought when Jesus told him, if you want to be saved, you have to be born again. Nicodemus asked, how do I climb back into my mother's womb? And Jesus was like, uh, it's not that type of birth. It's a different type of birth. Yeah. And so this makes us wonder, uh, what does being born again mean? And what, what, what's the power behind it? Because a lot of our culture sometimes wants to make fun of that. And they want to Ned Flanders it. And they have this tone to, have you been born again, brother? You know, <laughs> and, and, and they kind of minimize the power of that sentence and that question. Because being born again essentially means that you've been saved. So what is this whole born again thing? So every single one of us, we've had a first physical natural birth. Amen? Yeah. And uh, you had one because you're here. Yeah. Right? If you weren't here, you didn't have a physical birth. Um, you are composed of three things. You're composed of body, soul, and spirit. Your spirit is who you are. Your soul is your feeler, thinker, chooser. And your body is where your spirit lives in. Yeah. You understanding me? Yeah. So you got spirit, you got soul in the middle, yeah. and you got body. Yeah. When you popped out of your mother's womb, okay, you had your physical birth, yeah. but you haven't had your spiritual birth yeah. because we're born in a sinful nature. Yeah. So you don't have your spiritual birth, which means that the spirit is what longs to be with God. Yeah. The spirit is what longs to please God. It's the spirit that is within us that wants us to come to church. Your flesh wants you to party, get drunk, and twerk like crazy, okay? That's what your body wants. Your body also wants to be lazy, and it wants you to sleep in and not come to church at 3 o'clock in the afternoon because Sunday's a day for you to stay at home, and it's a homebody thing, right? A lot of homebodies just don't want to go out no more. Uh, that's, that's your body. Your body just wants to fulfill the desires that are within it. Your body is the one that desires to watch porn. Your body is the one that has a desire to cheat on your spouse or to cheat on your boyfriend or your girlfriend or to sleep with anybody that you can sleep with. Your body is the one that wants to not pay the bills, not pay the rent and live for free in your parents' house and you're 40. That's your body. Your body's just no good, okay? That, th this is what the Bible calls the flesh. Someone say the flesh. The flesh and the spirit are always opposing each other. The spirit wants God. The flesh wants you. And then your soul is in the middle of this whole thing. Your soul is like watching a Jerry Springer show, wondering which one do I side with? Should I turn this TV show off or should I keep it on? You're, you're, it's, 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 it's stuck in the middle because both your spirit and your flesh want to battle for territory. It's a constant battle for territory. And the one that wins is the one that you feed the most. Do you feed your spirit or do you feed your body? Now the problem is this, if you've not been born again, the only thing that's dominating your soul is your flesh. So the Bible says in Ephesians chapter two, we were dead in our sins and our transgressions, meaning you were dead in sin and then Jesus Christ saved you. And when Jesus Christ saved you, you had spiritual birth. That's your second birth. This is called being born Again, it's when you encounter Jesus for the first time and then Jesus awakens in you your spiritual life. Now, what's crazy is that you could be in church all your entire life and never have a spiritual birth. 
There, okay, 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 watch this. There are people that can't seem to commit and get it right. And the reason is because they haven't been born again. They haven't been born again. They haven't been saved. So we're looking at the question. So then how can I be sure of my salvation? How can I be sure that I am saved? Or how can I be sure that I need to get saved? That's a very important question to ask. Because as the Bible teaches, we believe that there is an eternal life after this life. That means that after your body dies, guess what? Your soul and your spirit keep living. Because your soul and your spirit, they are eternal. They're going to keep on living after this life. We believe in eternity. We believe in life after death. And the life that truly counts is not this one. This is a bus stop. Because eternity is so much longer than 100 years. You understand? This is very short. 100 years compared to eternity is nothing. So we are concerned about not so much how you live in this life, but we're mainly concerned about how you're going to spend your next life. And if you're not saved and if you're not born again, and your spirit hasn't been connected to Jesus because it hasn't had birth, you can't make it to heaven. You can't make it to heaven. And this is the difference between a right person with God versus a religious person. Religious people have not been born again, but through their own efforts and their own disciplines, they try to live a good Christian life. But it's all external. No internal, nothing internal. Now, those that have been born again, they are right with God because God makes them righteous. And the way that God makes them righteous and right before his sight is through their spiritual birth when they receive Jesus Christ into their hearts. So the question, once again, that we're posing is this. How can you be sure of your salvation? Do you know where you're going after you die? It's not enough to say, I think I'll go to heaven. It's not enough to think that I feel like I'm good. It's not enough to think or feel. What you need is to have assurance. Every single one of us needs to have assurance. But I know that sometimes a lot of us struggle with believing that you could be saved. Because there are others of you, you have secrets that your family don't know about. And if your family found out, my God. Others of you, you have secrets that your spouse doesn't know about. And you're wondering, is it really possible that God can actually forgive me after all that I've done? So I'm here to declare to you today, by the word of God, that God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. So that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The blood of Jesus shed on a cross does not cleanse you partially. It cleans you completely. And today, I want all of you to leave this building with assurance that you are saved. Jesus taught this in um, a lot through scripture. We're gonna look at a passage in first of John chapter five, verses 11 to 13 and then 18 to 21. And I want you to see how many times you see the word to know, okay? The two words we know or to know, okay? Watch this, or may know. Verse 11, and this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has a son has life. Whoever does not have God's son does not have life. I have written this to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may no. pause. That's peace. That's good. So that you may know. See, there are a lot of people that sometimes are in the Christian world and they've either been raised liberal or legalistic. Liberals think they know, but they're really lost. Those are the liberals, the legalists. They're always scared and petrified to go to sleep because they might wake up in hell the next day. And the reason why they believe in that is because they've been taught wrong. See, in the legalistic worldview, you don't know that you're saved. Because in the legalistic worldview, you have to earn God's love. And you have to behave really super well and you gotta be perfect. And you gotta earn God's approval and you gotta earn your salvation. And if, 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 if you misbehave, God will send you to hell. If you just slip up, God's going to punish you. And God's actually in heaven on his throne, looking down at your life, looking at it through a magnifying glass, waiting for you to make a mistake so that he can throw a lightning bolt. That is a legalistic worldview. And so guess what happens to people that have a legalistic worldview teaching? On their good days, they feel nice and strong. But when they mess up, oh my. It's like someone dropped a brick from heaven 
and it's sunk into their stomach. You feel guilt and condemned and you're up and down in the legalistic worldview. You're saved on your good days, but you're lost on your bad days. And so there's no assurance in that because all of it depends on you. And how many of us know that for it to depend on us is a bad plan because we're frail. How many of you have good days? How many of you have bad days? How many of you have more sinful days than holy days? Come on, say amen. I know I have more sinful days than holy days, guys. Because we're human. Remember, there is the flesh and then there is the spirit. These are two forces that are fighting against each other. And this, these two forces, this battle will never cease until you die. This is Galatians chapter 5. Take that note down. Galatians chapter 5. They are two forces that are going to battle against you till the day that you die. Because you can't be perfect. But in the legalistic worldview, if you're not perfect, you're screwed. And this is why so many young people have run away from the church because they say it's impossible. And it's not the, and the truth is this, that is not the message of Jesus Christ. That is also not the gospel message of Jesus Christ. That is also not why Jesus Christ came to die on the cross. Jesus Christ knew that you couldn't make it. So he lived the perfect life you should have lived and he died the death that you should have died. And aren't you grateful that God replaced all your misery, all your sin, all your mistakes, all your flaws, and he took it upon himself because he loved you? My God, we have a good God. Verse 13, I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Read that second word. We know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning for God's son holds them securely and the evil one cannot touch them. Read that second word one more time. We know that we are children of God and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. Read that third word. And we know that the son of God has come and he has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. And now we live in fellowship with the true God because we live in fellowship with his son. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the only true God and he is eternal life. So here's an instruction, dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Repeatedly, the Bible tells us so that we may know that you can know God's plan is for you to No. He doesn't want you to doubt. What assurance. What peace is found in doubt. If I'm saved or not. If he loves me or not. If he cares for me or not. If he bled for me or not. What assurance does that bring into the soul? God wants you to be sure. God wants you to know that you're safe. God wants you to know that he is able. He's able to save. And that's the main point that we want to drive today. That you don't only get to feel that you're saved, but you can also know that you're saved. The assurance of your salvation is built on three things. And that's what we're going to look at today. Three ways to have assurance of your salvation. Number one, your assurance is built on the Bible. Your assurance is is built on the Bible. The Bible is not just a sacred book. It is literally God's written voice. You gotta understand that. Some people don't read the Bible because they just don't find it interesting or relevant enough. Others are saying, I wish God would talk to me. And he does. You just don't read it. Or when I'm preaching God's word that's trying to talk to you, you're not listening. All you're doing is yawning. (laughs) And I take offense to that a little bit personally because I work really hard for these sermons. But God does speak and he speaks through his word because God's word is his literal translate. It's it's literally a translation of his voice into page and pen. The backbone of your assurance must come from knowing what the Bible says about your salvation. Not what you feel, not what you think, not what the majority of the people say. Definitely not what culture has to say. Your assurance has to be built on what the Bible says. Jesus taught us that we could know that we're saved. And we see this through Jesus' own words. 
when he's on a cross dying, he has two criminals on the side. Let's listen to the conversation they were having. Luke 23, verses 39 to 43. One of the criminals hanging beside Jesus scoffed. So you're the Messiah, aren't you? Well, prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested. Don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you. Clap right there, my brother. Ha! Ha! That's so good. That's confidence. That's assurance. I'm safe in his hands. I don't need to be wavering, doubting, fearing. He said, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. In this moment, Jesus gave this criminal something more valuable than any prestige, than any amount of money or title. And that was the assurance of his salvation. God wants you to know that you're right with him. He wants you to be sure and he wants you to be at peace. He doesn't want you doubting. And the apostle Paul wrote something on our assurance of the gospel message and salvation to this church in Thessalonica. And he wrote it in his first letter called first of Thessalonians chapter one, verse five. And he said this, for when we brought you the good news, what's the good news? Salvation, that you're saved, that Jesus Christ paid for your sins, right? Yeah, yeah this is all salvation. So he says this, for when we brought you the good news about, about salvation, it was not only with words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance. I would clap my hands right there. Let's take a praise break. Because God is a good God. I praise the Lord. I'm so thankful that we have a God that gives us assurance. That we don't have to be, you know, uh, uh, fidgety, nervous, anxious. I don't know if I'm saved. What if I did that? Oh my God. That's not peace. But Jesus Christ, he is your prince of peace. Give your prince of peace on a pause. For when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true. Some people have done very sinful things. So their mindsets, their mindset doubts that they could be saved. And they say things like this, oh, pastor, but you have no idea the things I've done. That's true. I probably don't. But all I can say to you is this, but you, you have no idea how big and powerful the blood of Jesus is. His blood is greater than any sin. It is greater than any mistake. His blood can break any chain from hell instantly at the mention of the name of Jesus. It's not in God's design for you to be tormented with not knowing whether or not you've been saved because there's no peace in that. And biblically speaking, you could be sure and secure of your salvation when it happens. And it's not because of anything that you have done, but because of everything that Jesus did and everything that he has done on the cross for you. Number two, your assurance is also built on a changed life. And this is where the sermon starts getting better. Not that it wasn't. It was already really good. See, when a person truly experiences salvation, there will be visible evidence of a changed life. And we see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14, 15, and 17. Listen to what it says. Since we believe that Christ died for all. For how many? All. Not some. No, for all. That's you. That's me. If you've been doubting, if Jesus can save you, forgive you, if you've been doubting, if Jesus loves you, I'm here to tell you, biblically speaking, he loves you and he wants to save you and he can save you. 
And if you believe that Jesus can't save you because he's mad at you, you believe the lie. I'm here to speak the truth over your soul. I'm here to testify the blood of Jesus is greater than any mistake, any past, any sin, any type of thing that you've ever done. The blood of Jesus can cover it completely. You are covered from head to toe, my brother. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. Verse 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new? Person. The? Old life. It's gone, Andy. New life. Has new life. begun. In Christ, you are made new. In Christ, you have a new life. In Christ, you are a new creation. But the key thing here is in Christ. Now, if you're not in Christ, and all you did was just have a moment here at an altar, or you just repeated a prayer for the sake of repeating it, and there is no evidence of a changed life, then your salvation experience may not be genuine. When you're saved, your old life is in the past, and you start a new one. This is when the beliefs in the Bible begin to shape your character, your behavior, and your decisions. If you claim to be a Christian, but your life hasn't changed, your places of entertainment haven't changed, the crowds you hang out haven't changed, the drinking, the drugs, the promiscuity, the lust, the vanities of life, if those are all the same as it always has been, let me tell you, you found religion, but you did not find Christ. If there's no change in you, if, if you're still nonchalant, about God, if the gospel doesn't excite you, if, if you're not committing to the Lord and his work and his church and his word, if you're not committed to prayer, if you're not, if you're not enjoying any of this, you have to re-examine. You probably found religion. Let me give it to you this way, okay? Here's an, an analogy, okay? If I'm on a highway trying to film a video in the middle of it uh, for TikTok or something dumb like that, and uh, let's say I'm taking a picture and I have my headphones in or my AirPods in and I don't hear a huge semi truck coming behind me and my photographer is kind of a jerk and didn't tell me. If I get, if I encounter that semi truck and that semi truck impacts me, I cannot get up and walk the same. Because the semi truck has so much more power than I do that if it touches me, if it hits me, if it impacts me, I'm going to have to change. Okay. Coming to Jesus Christ is the same. When he impacts you and you encounter him, truly, it is impossible for you to walk the same. There are a lot of people who have confused their salvation experience with a prayer moment. And there are a lot of people that have confused Jesus Christ with religion. It is possible to chill and hang out around the cross of Jesus Christ, but also not bend your knee and surrender to Jesus. There are so many people that love to hang around the cross, but not surrender to the cross. Hanging around the cross is what religious people do, but people who are right with God, they say what the apostle Paul said in Galatians 2.20, my old self has been crucified. With who? Christ. Read this next sentence that's underlined with me. One, two, three. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in, the, in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's give God praise. Here's what you need to know. The gospel of Jesus Christ isn't a self-help message or a self-promotion one. It is a crucifixion message where the desire in our life is to be less like ourselves and to be more like Jesus. John put it this way in John 3.30, he must become greater and greater and I must become less and less. I like this other translation in the amplified version. This is what John said. He said, he must increase, but I must decrease. He must grow more prominent I must grow less so. 
when we look at your life through your salvation experience, have you changed? Or are you still the same? When we look at your life, when you look at mine, do you see more of Marlon Medina? That's my name, just in case you didn't know. Or do you see more of Jesus? When we look at your life, who shows more? Nick, let me ask you a question. When the heat of life is on, and life is squeezing you, who do we see more? It's a good question to think about. You know why? Because it shows you. Do you have more of Jesus in you? Are you decreasing as he increases? Or are you increasing as he decreases? Evidence of salvation is based on a changed life. Now, there's a difference between being perfect, okay? Because we can't be perfect because some of you might be getting the message of, oh my gosh, does it mean I'd have to be perfect? That's legalism. Yeah. So I want to explain something to you. There's a difference between you falling into a moment of weakness and premeditating your sin. Yeah. Let me explain it to you this way. If I start planning to cheat on my wife by picking a hotel, not in Vancouver, but in Whistler, because yeah. it's you know close enough, but far enough, and I pick the time, I pick the date, and then I put on camouflage clothing, and I go like around 2, 3 a.m. when all of my church is asleep. And I tell her what hotel room I'm gonna be at, and I tell her what my alias is to ask for what name I should put it under. I'm not using my credit card, I'm using who knows what. Okay, right there, what am I doing? I am pre-meditating. I'm planning it. Now there's a difference between me premeditating my sin Versus me falling into a moment of weakness. So let's pretend that I have a swearing problem. <clears throat> let's pretend that I like to say bad words a lot, okay? And then one day I'm walking, and I'm walking in my house barefoot. And then all of a sudden, there's a corner, a very sharp wooden corner. And I'm walking barefoot, and I hit my pinky, my toe pinky, on the side and the corner of a table. And I go, oh, right there, I fell into a moment of weakness, which is totally different than me premeditating and thinking. So my question to you is this. Are you someone that is living a life of premeditated sin? Or are you someone that just battles with weakness? If you are someone that has a lifestyle of premeditating your sin, you may have to check up and re-examine your salvation experience. So to take Christianity as a thing to live a religious life on the weekend and continue to live in the contradiction to God's word during the week, that is not true salvation. True salvation always changes your life and your desires because true salvation gives you a new heart. Yeah. yeah. Let's recap. Number one, your assurance is built on? Bible. Number two, your assurance is built on? A changed life. Here's number three. You ready? Write this down. Your assurance is built on genuine salvation. Your assurance is built on genuine salvation. So this makes us beg the question, what is true salvation? What is genuine salvation? A lot of people have made very funky and weird definitions on this, but we must stick to what the Bible says and how the Bible defines it, not by our own feelings, the opinion of the masses, or worse, what culture says. We must always go to what the word of God says. And the first thing that you must understand is that God does not teach us to doubt our salvation, but he does teach us to examine it. We see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. We saw this in the first week, which was last week. So if you haven't seen week one, here's a shameless plug. Go to your YouTube channel, Crave Church. Watch week one of the salvation series. And so let's review quickly what we saw last week. Every true saved follower of Jesus has four common habits that allows us to check if our faith is genuine or not. So... What are the four signs of genuine salvation? These are not the only four, but these are good fundamental ones. Number one, you read your Bible every day. Last week we saw that. Now I'm wondering, how many of you read your Bible from Monday to Sunday? And here's the thing. If you don't read your word, anybody can fool you. Here's the second one. You pray every day. If you don't pray, when moments of temptation and weakness and storms come, you will fold. You got to pray. How many of you prayed every day from Monday to Sunday? Ever since last week? Did you actually do it? 
And here's the thing. Some people go like, I don't know if I should because I just don't know what to say and I don't know how to pray long. If you don't know how to pray long, pray for 15 seconds. Yeah. Like literally do it. Like get up, get up, get up from your, your bed. When you wake up, bend your knees, 15 seconds. Be like, God, I want to pray more than 15 seconds, but I really don't know what else to say. So walk with me today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Yeah. And go to work. Yeah. Go to school. Yeah. And do that for a week. 15 seconds. Yeah. It's not much. No uh -huh. And then the next week, double it. Go to 30 seconds. Yeah. Wake up and from Monday to Sunday, pray for 30 seconds. And then the week after that on week three, guess what? Double it. Go for a minute. Yeah. By the time that you know it, you're going to be preaching. You're going to be not preaching. Maybe you'll be preaching. You're going to be praying for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then you're going to go to 30. And then you're going to go to the hour. And then you're going to be like, wow, it all started with 15 seconds. Just do it. Just do it. My brother, get up and do it. My sister, wake up 15 seconds before your alarm and pray. And your life will begin to change. And your character will begin to get better. And your closest to God will get closer. You will change because prayer changes us. You will grow stronger. And when the storms come, you won't fold. But people that fall into temptations all the time, I'll tell you, one of the main things and one of the main reasons why they battle temptations is because they don't pray. And they don't read. Here's the third one. You consistently attend a Bible-believing church. Key word is consistently. Not consistently for two weeks. Consistently every Sunday. It is God's word that you are violating and disobeying the moment that you don't make church a priority. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. And for all of the people that are watching online or anybody that is in this room, that you like church hopping. Church hopping is not biblical. You have to be planted in a church. You can't be a plant that gets planted in soil, then you cut yourself and go plant yourself in another soil, cut yourself again, plant yourself in a different soil, and expect to grow. What happens to a plant that we chop and plant, plant, chop and plant, plant and chop, chop and plant? What happens? It dies. Do you know why so many Christians are not living? It's because they keep chopping themselves and they are dying. If you're dating many churches, you gotta pick one and marry one. And you gotta serve. And you gotta commit. And you know what? You know one thing that we need to kill? Is consumer Christianity. Where you believe in Jesus, you're a Christian, and all you do is just come get fed. When are you gonna do something? When will you serve? When will you carry some weight? When will you obey the Lord and Savior that actually saved you for real? You know what Jesus said? Go. He didn't say go to church. He said go into the world. Doing what? Making disciples. Doing what? Baptizing them in the name of Father, Father Son, and Holy Spirit. Come on, Suri. You have a way louder voice. When you guys go to restaurants, I know that you're way louder than that. <laughs> Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The thing that people care about the most is what they speak before they leave this earth. In people's deathbeds they will only mention the things that they care about the most. Do you know before Jesus Christ left this world, he spoke what he cared about the most. And you know what that was? To go and make disciples, mm -hmm. baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Do you know how we do that here at Crave Church? Through city groups. Yeah. Yeah. You first attend one. Then you assist and co-lead one. Then you go open your own space of grace. And there you are fulfilling the commission of Jesus Christ to make disciples. And all our city group leaders are the ones that baptize people in our church. I don't baptize people. I already baptized my 12. Now it's their turn to baptize their 12. Come on. And that's how we fulfill the great commission here in this church. Yeah. Well, my question is this. Are you a consumer? Mm -hmm. Or are you a contributor? Mm -hmm. Nobody likes a boyfriend that lives with his girlfriend and plays video games all day doesn't clean the house, doesn't help out with any responsibilities or any chores. Mm -hmm. No one likes that. It's a lazy, glutton boyfriend mm -hmm. that doesn't do anything in a house to help. Mm -hmm. Isn't that true? Look at me for a few seconds. Yeah. Let's talk for real. Yeah. Isn't it true that nobody would like that? Yeah. Why are we like that in the house of God? Wow. Where all we do is come and steal the church's Wi-Fi. <laughs> Eat spiritually, eat, 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 eat. Laugh a lot because I'm funny. 
And then you professionally sit for an hour and a half <laughs> to go to a restaurant and sit some more yeah. and talk about the word of God. That's cute. That's good. But I think more than talking, we should be building. But you can't build if you don't consistently attend. Are you consistently attending Crave Church? And if Crave Church is not your church, and you go to another one in the morning, are you consistently attending that one? Are you helping that pastor? Are you praying? Are you building? Are you volunteering? Or are you too important for it? Three attributes, four attributes. Number one, you read your Bible every day. You pray every day. Number three, you consistently attend a Bible-believing church. And number four, you pray for others to get saved. If you are saved, you have Jesus in your heart. Amen. Now, if you have Jesus in your heart, you have a piece of Jesus' heart in yours. What does Jesus care most about? Souls. So look at me. Check yourself right now, okay? Check yourself right now. For real. Do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Do it. Let's do this together. Do you really genuinely care about someone you've never met to find Jesus? Did you think about them today? Did you pray about them? You're not a bad person if you don't. But it's a good heart check. It's a good heart check to know where you're at. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you cried with tears for lost people to be saved? Let me ask you another question. When was the last time you came to church to pray for lost people? When was the last time you came to one of our prayers? And this is a marker that examines your spiritual salvation. Are you truly saved? Truly saved Christians have these four common habits and possibly even more. But these are the four fundamentals. They read their Bible every day. Not legalistically, but they try to do it every day. When I say try, I mean try. Not like your try, the other try. They pray every day. They attend church consistently. And they generally pray for the salvation of other people. Now, you might be like, well, I do it at home by myself. Can we really count on your word for that? Come on. Come on. Now, pastor, I believe in private prayer. I mean, didn't Jesus say that when you pray, get into your prayer closet, close the door behind you, and don't let anybody hear? Yes, he did teach that. Because he's trying to teach about private prayer, of course. But he also taught corporate prayer in Acts. Yeah. If you read in Acts, they met every day to pray. Yeah. We're a little behind. I'm trying to pray once uh, a week per campus, and that's already a lot to ask for. Sorry, but biblically speaking, they gathered every day. Look at me. Look how far we've come. To think that coming every day to God's house is too much to ask for after he saved your damned soul. Wow. I feel like I can drop the mic right here, go to my office, pick up my stuff, and go home. That's conviction. Dang. So what is genuine salvation? We looked at the four markers of genuine salvation. What is genuine salvation? Romans chapter 3 verses 22 to 26 tells us. Are you ready to read with me? It says this. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes. Not half of us, but everyone. No matter who we are. You could be a very bad person, but if you believe in Jesus, he can forgive you. Amen. Why? For everyone has sinned. See that? We all, not half of us, not some of us, but we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yeah. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. And he did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. And here's what we know about genuine salvation. This is what genuine salvation looks like. People are made right. That means saved. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. And he makes sinners right in his sight when they? Believe. In? 
That's it. That's it. No spiritual hula hoops. No spiritual acrobats. No somersaults. So the next question is this. What do you do to generally get saved? What do you do to generally get saved? Well, first, you got to recognize that you're a sinner. If you don't know that you're bad and you think that you're cute and that you're an amazing snowflake, you're in trouble. Because that is straight up contradiction to God's word. Look what Romans chapter 3 verse 10 says. As the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. Romans 3 verse 23 says this, for everyone has sinned. It said everyone, not half. Everyone has sinned because we all fall short of God's glorious standard. The first thing that you got to understand is that you must, if you want to be generally saved, it has to start first by you accepting and acknowledging that you are a sinner. I've never seen Superman save someone that can save themselves. I've never seen Spider-Man come and interfere with someone that could save themselves. Every time Superman and Spider-Man and all these superheroes came and interfered with somebody for somebody, it's because they couldn't save themselves. Okay, if you can do it on your own because you're not a broken sinner, you don't need Jesus. And I want your autograph after this. But if you know that you're a sinner and that you're broken, then you qualify for salvation. Here's the second thing. The second thing is to repent of your sin. Look what 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It says this, The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. So true belief in Jesus births repentance. Some people, look, believe. But they don't believe. And so they believe here, theoretically, and they live and continue to live a lifestyle of sin that is in contradiction to God's word. And that's why they don't repent. That's why they don't seek true, genuine salvation and spiritual birth. Some of you in here today, you're not spiritually born again. And you want it. And you've been fighting to do it right and to be right with God through your own strength. But you won't make it with your own strength. You need to be born again. And that happens through number one, you have to recognize that you're a sinner. Number two, repent of your sin. And here's the third thing that you do. You receive Jesus. John chapter one, verses 10 to 12 says this. He was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Who is he talking about here? Jesus. Yeah, so let's read it again with understanding. Jesus was in the world and though the world was made through Jesus, the world did not recognize Jesus. He came to that which was his own but his own did not receive him. Verse 12, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. See, you gotta ask him to come into your heart and receive him. If you invited me for dinner and I'm knocking at your door, I'm gonna knock at your door, but I'm not gonna come in. I can't come in until you open the door and receive me. Yeah. I feel weird if I like, you know, opened the window by your door and stuck my hand in through your window and opened from the inside. I feel weird doing that to you because you have to receive me. Okay. Jesus says the same thing. You want to be saved. You got to receive me. You got to open the door. As a matter of fact, he actually uses that analogy in Revelation chapter three, verse 20. He says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Wow. wow. Here's my conclusion. For those of you who aren't saved by Jesus, today you know the three steps to take. For those that doubted their salvation, now you have the biblical tools to never allow doubt to torment you ever again. So let us rest in the assurance that Christ gives us through his word and his peace. Hey, thank you so much for tuning into our YouTube channel. It is a privilege and an honor to be able to teach you God's word. Can you do me a favor? Number one, would you subscribe? Number two, would you be able to hit the bell notification so that you can know when we upload a new video? Number three, share the message if this impacted your life. Love you so much and I'll see you in the next one.